It's about that time, so um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the inaugural conference of the Sesquicentennial Project. Um, we've been around for about four years, and we have some profile, but the profile of the project may not be as prominent at the college as it ought to be. I think it's growing. Indeed, the National Alumni Association is partnering with us, and uh, and I must uh, I thank them for the yeoman's job they had done, have done in getting it out, and uh, um, and the other things that they are doing uh, for us and with us, uh, the oral history project and the like. Uh, so we are we are very pleased that you have come to uh, this conference. This is the first, and uh, we hope to do uh, four uh, additional conferences uh, in the years leading up to 2017. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We hope that we say some things to you that will be informative. Um, but we, we hope that by 2017, we will have that glorious uh, celebration and commemoration of uh, the college's uh, sesquicentennial. Uh, I often, um, in talking with people, have to uh, 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 enunciate that word, sesquicentennial. But the sesquicentennial, as you know, is our is 150 years of whatever it is, and we will be 150 years in uh, 2017. But we didn't wait until 2016 to start working toward what we're gonna do. Um, as you well know, a number of, of other colleges and universities will be 150 years old in the next few years. Um, uh, Atlanta University, for instance, as a uh, undergraduate school, for many of you, you know that Atlanta University was founded in 1865, and it was a co-ed undergraduate school. It's now part of CAU, Clark Atlanta University. But it started in 1865, and if we are to commemorate just the Atlanta University part, it will be 150 years old in um, 2015. And then, of course, Clark was founded in 18. Uh, 69, so uh, 2019, it will be 150 years old. Spellman has a little while to go. Uh, I think um, 2031, it will be 150 years old, having been found in 1881. So we have a number of the black colleges are coming up very soon in the next uh, several decades that will be 150 years old, which is a milestone. But when you think about schools like Harvard, which in uh, 2036 will be 400 years old, and so you know, when you compare. But then there are some younger colleges and universities like the University of Chicago, which is younger than Morehouse, Duke, my other alma mater, which um, uh, is much, much younger than Morehouse as a university, having been founded only in 1925 as a university, built on Trinity College. But anyway, I won't get into that lecture I give on the founding of the colleges and so forth. The one that is one of our major uh, rivals, if you will, is Howard University. And of course, at some point when all of the products that we're working on, the books and the videos and the documentaries and the um, uh, 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 other things that we're working on, the Old History Project and the like, when they are revealed, um, it will show that we have done some serious research. And there again, we could talk about that for the rest of the time that we have allotted for this session, but I won't get into that. Suffice it to say, we have been to Howard University's archives on two occasions. And I think they were intrigued by what we are doing. And quite frankly, I don't think they had thought about what they would do. Howard is also 150 years old in 2017. The argument between us or the rivalry is, rivalry is that we were founded before them. We argue that we were founded in, May, uh, in February, Howard in May, but you, know, you could quibble about that. Suffice it to say, uh, we, we are very pleased that you're here today to hear what we have to say in the various sessions. Uh, we hope that you can stay for other sessions, but if you have other obligations, we can understand that. I, I was telling Mr. Calhoun that I believe around 10-ish, we might have more people coming in as my classes have been dismissed. One of my students is here, Mr. Pastor uh, Jones. Um, but uh, I, I'm almost confident that other students will be coming in around that time, so we do welcome you to the first session. Unfortunately, Dr. Bobby Donaldson will not be here. Um, he had obligated himself to come, but something came up in, uh, in Columbia where he is uh, located at the University of South Carolina. I understand C-SPAN is gonna be in town filming something or some forum, and the mayor of uh, 
Columbia, ask him to be the liaison for African Americans, whatever that means. So he is not able to be with us today, um, and he sent his regrets. We are hoping that uh, maybe next year when we uh, have our second conference, he will be able to come. He is considered an expert on William Jefferson White, and I, of course, will talk about William Jefferson White in my paper. So let me get to the paper, otherwise it'll <laughs> Time will run out and I will have been talking about the context of, of what, why we're here. As you see from your program, my paper is entitled The Lighting of the Candle, and of course you know the seminal work on Moir so far is A Candle in the Dark by Edward Allen Jones, which came out in uh, 1967 to commemorate the centennial of the college. And so we kind of use that imagery of the candle in the dark, and so the candle had to be uh, lit at some point. So in my paper, I'm talking about the lighting of the candle, the founding of the Augusta Theological Institute, 1844-1871. On a cold winter's evening in 1867, a group of men affiliated with the Springfield Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia, met in the home of Jonas Singleton, a deacon of the, at the church, to finalize the list of names of those who would become the first students at what would be known as the Augusta Theological Institute. The deacons were responding to a letter from the Reverend Dr. Edmund Turney, founder of the National Theological Institute in Washington, D.C., to organize a branch of the institute in this river city and that had been delivered by Richard Coulter to William Jefferson White, who was a resident of Augusta. Among the men at the February 16th meeting were Reverend Henry Watts, pastor at the Springfield Baptist Church, Deacon Jesse Jones, who kept the minutes of their deliberations, and William Jefferson White, who presided at the meeting. Mr. White subsequently approached a friend, Captain Charles H. Prince, who secured the support of the American Missionary Association, a Congregationalist organization in New England. Other leaders of Springfield who must be considered founders of the Augusta Institute are John Shefton, who is the editor of The Colored American and Augusta's first black newspaper, Robert Harper, a skilled piano tuner and musician, Simeon Beard, a Union Army officer, Thomas Beard, who became a state legislature, a legislator, and of course, Richard C. Coulter, a graduate of the National Theological Institute. And while these men and others are important players in the founding of the institution that became Morris College, Richard Turner, or Richard Coulter, Edmund Turney, and William Jefferson White are pivotal to the establishment of the Augusta Theological Institute and will be discussed in greater detail later uh, in this narrative or in the book. But at this early point in the narrative, a substantive backstory of the city where the college was founded and the history of African Americans are required. Augusta is the second oldest city in Georgia. It was founded three years after General Oglethorpe received a royal charter from the Crown of England to establish a 13th colony in America for the poor and destitute. Oglethorpe's vision became a reality with the settlement of Savannah in 1733. But he soon learned that the indigenous Creeks, Indians, resented the practice of the Carolina traders. This prompted Oglethorpe to obtain legislation requiring traders west of the Savannah River to secure a Georgia license and on uh, June the 14th, 1736, gave orders to lay out the town of Augusta. The city was named for Princess Augusta of Saxe Gotha, uh, the wife of Frederick, Prince of Wales. Strained relations with the indigenous people and discontent among the settlers prompted the white settlers to join the movement for revolution. At its beginning, Georgia banned slavery, but due to the great success of the colony of uh, slaveholding South Carolina, its neighbor to the north, we debated whether it was to the east or to the north, and we concluded that, quite frankly, uh, uh, South Carolina is to the north. I still think it's to the east uh, when you look at maps, but at any rate, South Carolina, its neighbor to the north. Georgia uh, began to allow slavery around 1750. There were blacks in Augusta uh, before 1750 as the settlement worked gangs of enslaved Africans brought over from Carolina even before it was legal to do so. 
It was also around the time of the American Revolution that blacks had come to populate the Springfield community. A 1759 plat identified Springfield adjacent to land owned by Francis McCartan uh, that was once owned by Martin Campbell. The land was inherited by McCartan Campbell, Martin's son, and the ditch on the property that drained into the Savannah River became known as Campbell's Gully. The Springfield lost its identity in 1798 when it was incorporated by the new charter for the city of Augusta. At its incorporation, Springfield was described as blighted in terms of its uh, in environment. It was said that the residents lived amid gullies, vapors, fogs, creeks, and lagoons. It was at this place, the Springfield settlement between Campbell's Gully, Hawks Gully, and the Savannah River, that in the 1780s, the Springfield Baptist Church, the oldest black church in the United States of America, uh, and the founding institution of Morehouse College was established. Edwin Cashin's excellent book, uh, Old Springfield uh, and uh, Religion in Augusta, this is Ed Cashin's book, um, talks about this and it's very useful to this narrative. According to many scholarly works, including Old Springfield, Springfield Baptist Church evolved from the Silver Bluff Baptist Church that had been founded in South Carolina in the early years of the 18th century. When Silver Bluff disbanded and its congregation moved across the Savannah River to Augusta, they comprised a new body of communicants in the Springfield settlement and named their church, which had been called a Silver Bluff Baptist, Springfield Baptist Church, having already been settled. But it is very plausible that blacks were in Augusta before its inception. Blacks and whites crossed the Savannah River, the divide between Georgia and South Carolina, and that was crucial to the development of the Garden City, as Savannah's, uh, as Augusta is called, for all imaginable reasons. Blacks often accompan accompanied white planters and agribusinessmen when they came to, into Augusta and its envir environs uh, to transact business. In 1800, Augusta had a slave population of 1,017 a free black population of 39, and a white population of 1,159 for a total of 2,215 people. In the same year, Richmond County, uh, where, which includes the city of Augusta, had a slave population of 2,693, a free black population of 54, and a white population of 2,728, 2 which aggregated at 5,457. By 1860, the county showed a slave population of 8,389, a free black population of 490, and a head count, therefore, of 12,105. Of that census count, Augusta had a slave population of 3,000, separate from Richmond County, 3,663, a free black population of 386, and a white population of 8,444 for a total of 12,000. 493. It's important to know uh, these kind of demographics because, as you see, there were free blacks in Augusta even in the early parts of the antebellum age. It is from this population of slaves and free blacks in Augusta and Richmond County that the students were identified who constituted the 37 names that William Jefferson White sent to the National Theological Institute in Washington, D.C. in February 1867. By 1860, however, most African Americans lived in the uh, Fourth Ward, about 1,371, not in the Third Ward, you need to know Augusta, uh, where Springfield was located. Lo uh, Springfield was in the Augusta Third Ward. We often think of the Fourth Ward that we have in Atlanta. But Springfield was located not in the Third Ward, where most blacks live, but it was in the Third Ward. Blacks in Richmond County were listed in the tax digest to slaveholders, most likely relatives. There were some blacks that were listed in the tax digest for the city of Augusta and Richmond County as being slaveholders. But as we well know, very often they were uh, members of families that had been purchased out of slavery. But by 1860, Peter Johnson, a blacksmith, was listed as the only freed black slaveholder in Augusta. Scholars have posited that the slaves of Augusta and Richmond County provided not only the labor system on which, upon which the economy was built, but the foundation of the social order as well. This uh, position, however, begs the question, 
what were the socioeconomic circumstances of the 37 persons who made up the first class of students at what would eventually become Morehouse College in 1913. By 1913, uh, well, that decade was some distance away, and Mr. Calhoun would talk about that uh, in his paper. Uh, Robert Brisbane tells us that after the Civil War, the grand task of clothing the Negro with civil and political rights was spurred on by the need of practical politics and political idealism, which hung over from the days of Jacksonian democracy. Clothing the African American in literacy and education must be added to the grand task described by Pro Professor Brisbane. But this was not an easy task given the pre-1865 social status of most blacks. Most blacks in Augusta and Richmond County had been slaves before the end of the Civil War and emancipation in 1865. Composing the small fraction of the African American population in Georgia, there were only 3,500 uh, free blacks in 1860, uh, in 1860, representing only 1% of the state's black population. Most free blacks lived in coastal and urban areas, especially in Savannah and Augusta. The majority were poor, working class folk, suppressed by a white majority that considered them at best a nuisance and at once a threat to the whole system of slavery. A majority of the free blacks in Georgia were born to mothers who were free and they took their status. But a small number of free blacks were manumitted by proceedings that sometimes evaded or ignored the law. Many were mulattoes, the progeny of white fathers. John Hope, the first African-American president of the American Baptist Seminary, which of course would become Morris College, was the son of a white father and a black mother. A few became literate in spite of laws prohibiting blacks uh, from learning or from teaching blacks how to or read and write and become literate, literate. But their lives were tenuous at best. And while a handful of the free blacks were able to prosper, most earned uh, their meager incomes as draymen, potters, cooks, farmers, artisans, seamstresses, washerwomen, and unskilled day laborers. The Springfield Baptist Church, where the first class of the Augusta Theological Institute would be held more than two decades later, was purchased from the St. John Baptist Church in 1844. The Methodist in Georgia had constructed the Asbury Meeting House on Green Street in 1801. And when the members of the Springfield Baptist Church bought the structure, they literally moved it from Green Street on logs more than a mile to Marbury Street, now I think 12th Street in Augusta, closer to the Savannah River. And we've been fascinated by that, and we need to discover more information how that went about, how that happened. They moved the church on logs. This is in 1844, literally, and we have documentation from the sources in Augusta that tell us that, but we need more information how that, how that happened. I would love to read uh, in the uh, extant newspaper articles how that went down. I'm sure that, that must have been something to, to see moving this whole church if you know what, what it looks like. On the cover of the program is the, uh, is the church. So if you can refer to your program, that's the church that they moved, how it looked then. There's a new on Green Street. And of course, uh, the church no longer has the, the bell tower but uh, uh, it, it uh, was dismantled, and I think it, for a while it may have existed at the new location. This is the church that they literally moved, and if you've been to a, a Springfield Baptist Church, the church is still there, actually. Um, uh, the name of the Asbury Meeting House was changed to the Springfield Baptist Church. The Springfield Church became the center of religious and social life for African Americans in Augusta. The church where the um, Augusta Theological Institute was founded in uh, 1869, uh, 1867, is now the education building for the Springfield Baptist Church and is the oldest church building in Georgia that is still in use. The oldest church building in Georgia that is still in use. And I, I got that from, from uh, Ed Cash. The end of the Civil War. After four years of fighting over the question of slavery in the United States, the Civil War came to an end on April the 9th, 1865. More than four million blacks previously held in bondage was now free. The day of jubilee was at hand, and the freedmen exhorted, exhorted, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Freedom was expressed in a multiplicity of ways. Some uh, slaves saw freedom as the right not to work under any circumstances, while others thought just the opposite and sought gainful employment. 
Most freedmen left the plantations where they had resided under abject conditions, but most of them returned to work as sharecroppers or tenant farmers. Thousands of emancipated African Americans took extraordinary measures to reconnect with deracinated family members and loved ones. That was a major um, um, effort, social movement among African Americans after the Civil War to reconnect with family members that had been separated. Perhaps the most horrific thing of slavery was the separation of families. Beatings and whippings and maimings, yes, that was bad. But families that were separated, many people consider that to be the most uh, uh, serious and horrific thing, horrific thing that happened in slavery. There was a sense of urgency for strong familiar bonds among the freedmen that lasted among African Americans well into the 20th century. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Billingsley uh, argues that point that for uh, a long time, well into the 20th century, I think he says up to the 1960s, strong family bonds. And uh, the family with two parents in the house was, was very much part of the African American social structure into the 1960s. Uh, and of course, the changes that have taken place uh, may be seen in two ways, positive and negative. It's not always negative just because you don't have two parents. But anyway, uh, many adults with grown children wanted to marry under religious uh, covenants, and they did so. Meetings were held among the freedmen across the old confederacy to plan for their future. One such meeting was held in Augusta in December 1865. The call to convene was announced in the Colored American, the newspaper owned uh, and edited by the member of the church, in December 1830-1865. Titled Freedmen's Convention to the Friends of Equal Justice in Georgia, the clarion call implored the black citizens of Georgia to convene. You are invited to send delegates to a convention to be held in the city of Augusta on Wednesday, the 10th day of January next. Believing that the time had come when we should consult together and that important question demand uh, of, uh, our uh, immediate attention. We feel that it's important that the friends from every part of the state meet and careful consider the present state of affairs. Uh, the announcement gave the rationale for calling the meeting, and I quote, we are living in an important era in the history of the world. A large number of our citizens were but a few a month since held in bondage. Now, they are freedmen. They are entitled to the rights of citizenship. Now that they are freedmen, they are entitled to the rights of citizenship. How to secure these rights is the important question. We appeal to the nobler feelings of those in authority asking them to deal justly by all the citizens of the state. With this spirit, let us assemble and show to the world that the friends of equal justice are also the friends of law. The announcement was signed, many citizens, and requested that counties that had large cities in them are invited to send five delegates, and those that have small towns were invited to send three. According to one account, 100 black delegates answered the call and met at the Springfield Baptist Church on January the 10th, 1866. This is the year before Mars was found. The Reverend James Porter, a freeborn Negro who had been with the group that met with General Sherman in Savannah, was chairman of the Freedmen's Convention. Reflecting the general mood of freedmen across the old slave states, the delegates were uh, generally conciliatory toward whites. But they did go on record favoring uh, uh, some action to be taken uh, uh, against whites. Page out of order. Equal pay. Uh, they went on record calling for equal pay and called for voting rights, jury duty, equality in public accommodations, and universal education. Those were some of the demands that they wanted. Equal pay, right to vote, jury duty, equality in public accommodation, civil rights, and universal education. Headed by J.E. Bryant, a white Republican, the convention formed the Georgia Equal Rights Association with branches in several cities. The association was an advocacy group for black rights and to keep northern in, uh, northerners informed of the reign of terror, a reign of terror against African Americans in the South. But in the area of education, a school was already operating at Springfield with day hours from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon and night hours from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Miss H.C. Foote was the teacher at the school in 1867, the year before uh, the Augusta Institute was founded, at Springfield Baptist Church. As the Georgia Equal Rights Association, the precursor of the Republican Party in Georgia, was getting organized, White violence toward blacks and black sympathizers, uh, real and imagined, escalated. 
The violence was a result of deep-seated beliefs in the innate inferiority of Af uh, peoples of African descent and outrage over the loss of the Civil War. The founding of the Augusta Theological Institute. The National Theological Institute had been founded in Washington, D.C. in 1864, and by 1867, branches, a branch of the institute had been organized as the Richmond Theological Institute in this Virginia city, the capital of the Confederate States of America by that name. The Augusta Theological Institute, the official founding name of Morehouse College, would be the second branch of the National Institute and University. The mission of the National Theological, uh, Theological Institute uh, was twofold. One, to proselytize the freedmen and convert them to the Baptist denomination, and two, to educate the newly freed African Americans for uplift and citizenship. Richard Coulter, a former slave and one of the founders of the Augusta Institute, left Washington in the fall of 1866, perhaps traveling on the Atlantic and Gulf Railroad, with a letter from Dr. Turney, and I quote, authorizing him to establish a school in Augusta at some, or some other uh, location in the South, which he might choose. Coulter chose Augusta, the place of his birth and early life. He was 33 years old when he presented the letter to William Jefferson White. Richard Coulter had left Augusta in the service of his slaveholder as a valet or a valet. And like thousands of other blacks, he had joined the Confederate Army uh, in one capacity or another, generally in support service occupations to white military uh, regiments. But also like many other blacks in military service and otherwise, Coulter was determined to be free. He fled to Washington, but as the theaters of war moved northward toward the national capital, Coulter fled to Philadelphia. When the Civil War ended, he was determined to return uh, to his native Augusta, where he felt his talent and training were sorely needed, and where he could make a difference in the lives of his people. On his journey back to Augusta, Georgia, Richard Coulter stopped in Washington, D.C. There he took a job to earn money to help finance his trip back to Augusta. He also took classes at the fledgling National Theological Institute, where he met Dr. Turney. This Coulter Turney encounter would give birth to the idea of a school in the South that would, in less than 50 years, become Morehouse College. And Mr. Um, Calhoun, my colleague, would talk about the college that became Morehouse in 1913. William Jefferson White was unaware of the important role he would play in the history uh, when Coulter left Washington on the Atlantic and Gulf Railroad in late 1866. The Reverend White recalled the first meeting with Coulter, whom he had not known before, uh, uh, before slavery uh, uh, and during the Civil War. It was late in the fall of 1866 that a fine, and I'm quoting William Jefferson White now, it was late in the fall of 1866 when that fine young man of perhaps 30 years, Richard C. Coulter by name, called at the large furniture house of Platt Brothers and asked for the undertaker, William J. White. He was directed to what we call the coffin room on the third floor of the manufacturing company. It was there that Coulter found White, who was an undertaker for the firm and in charge of the coffin department. White did not make coffins, but he supervised a staff of a dozen men under his uh, direction. A stock worth of, of about $10,000 had to be maintained to meet the requirements of the business, and everything was manufactured, uh, manufactured on the premises except iron caskets, which were only used when bodies were to be transported. Fine woods from the West Indies were largely used, and the duty of keeping up supplies was not a light one. Dr. Turney had given Coulter a letter authorizing him to establish a school in Augusta, as I said in the summer. He knew the Reverend White's pomp prominence in the city, and Coulter turned the letter over to him. White remembered this fortuitous encounter. He said, Brother White, Dr. Turney put this letter in my hand when I was leaving Washington, but I find that I can do nothing with it. And so I have come to turn it over to you. If anybody can do uh, anything with it, you can. Uh, Dr. White, Mr. White said, I read the letter carefully, then asked which Brother Coulter, uh, asked Dr. Brother Coulter about it. The outcome was that I sat down at my desk right there in the coffin room and wrote Dr. Turney in Washington, informing him that his letter given by uh, Brother Coulter had been turned over to me and suggested to him that I would be glad to have a branch of his school in Augusta. 
and saying that I was glad that I would gladly render any assistance uh, in my power to this end. This open correspondence between us, and in a short while, it was agreed that if I would secure sufficient students for the society, uh, they would then supply a teacher without cost to the school. Richard Coulter, a bright young man, remained in Augusta, but his relationship to the Augusta Theological Institute is a mystery. We're still trying to discover more about Richard Coulter, and those of us who are working on the history of Morehouse and Dr. Donaldson, who is working on William Jefferson White, we're still in the, in, somewhat in the dark about who, William, uh, who Richard Coulter was. We know he brought the letter, we have facts on that, but after that, he kind of disappears uh, into, the, uh, into the area there. He did not join the congregation, that is Richard Coulter, did not join the congregation at Springfield Baptist Church, but became a member of Central Baptist Church, pastored by the honored old veteran, the Reverend William uh, Henry Jackson, who also taught at the Walker Street School in Augusta. Coulter was soon licensed to preach and was quite useful. We do know that. Before the end of the Civil War, there were five, five black churches in Augusta, Springfield Baptist, Thankful Baptist, Trinity Baptist, Colored Methodist, Central Baptist, and Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, many of these churches had grown out of Springfield Baptist Church, which is kind of considered the mother Baptist church in Augusta. Thankful Baptist Church was formed by members of the Central Baptist Church and had a national reputation. William Jefferson White was a member of Springfield Baptist Church, the most prominent black church in town at that time. And when he agreed to take the lead in the venture that resulted in the forming of the Augusta Theological Institute, White discussed the matter with the Reverend Henry Watt, Springfield's pastor, and with the deacons of the church. Emboldened by their deliberations and by the actions of Dr. Uh, Reverend Watt, who immediately began to recruit students for the bold enterprise, promising to use the church as a schoolhouse, the foundation of the institute was laid in a series of meetings held at the home of Deacon, uh, Deacon Jonas Singleton, with White serving as chairman and Deacon Jesse uh, H. Jones serving as secretary. And so it came to pass, on February the 14th, 1867, William Jefferson White, on the authority of the Institute's founding fathers, sent a letter, uh, uh, sent a list of 37 names to Dr. Edmund Turney in Washington, D.C., representing the first class of students at the Augusta Institute. That's the other big mystery. Who were the members of, who were the names on that list? The 37 names on the list that William Jefferson White sent to Washington, D.C. to Reverend Edmund Turney, constituting the first class of students to enroll at Morehouse College, which at that time was called the Augusta Theological Institute. We are hoping that we can get into the archives at Springfield Baptist Church, and perhaps the names may be revealed, but we have not been able to find the names of the 37 people uh, uh, that were the students that were enrolled. We do know that they were not necessarily tra traditional college students. Uh, William Jefferson White recalled, we enrolled deacons, preachers, and young men aspiring to the ministry. No females, uh, no other than those above, were enrolled. It was to me one of the most inspiring experiences of my life, he said. A majority of the men enrolled were older than myself, but with them it appeared to make no difference. These were the first students at the Augusta Institute. Along with the list of students was a request for a teacher. This was the humble, somewhat inauspicuous beginning of what would become Morehouse College, one of the world's most prominent institutions of higher learning. Its beginnings were very inauspicious. Uh, the request for a teacher at the incipient Augusta Theological Institute was not immediately granted, and Dr. Com uh, Turney commissioned William Jefferson White to assume this role in such, until such time as a teacher could be supplied. Recognizing the time and effort he and his associates had put into the bold enterprise, it was with some reservations that Mr. White as, uh, accepted the temporary appointment to become the first teacher. But as we recall the founding of D.O. Morehouse as the Augusta Institute, we have to ask the question, why? Why was there a need for another grade school in Augusta when four schools for blacks already existed? Did the founding of the Institute have something to do with the socioeconomic class of the members of Springfield Baptist Church, or did it have something to do with theology and doctrine? I think it had to do with something with both. The latter theory is not as persuasive as the former, as all of the other schools were founded by the American Missionary Association, the Congregationalists, and religious, uh, religious lessons were an integral part of the curriculum. 
The Bible was universally used in the classroom. <coughs> Doctrinal differences between the Congregationalists and the Baptists, the Congregationalists AMA, and the Baptists at Springfield. But what was the general socioeconomic class of the parishioners at Springfield? Shortly after the end of the Civil War, the American Missionary Association established schools for blacks across the old Confederacy, uh, in, uh, as we know. Um, um, Atlanta University comes out of that, that, uh, that missionary zeal. Records of the papers of the Bureau of Refugees, Freemen, and Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen Bureau, show that the American um, uh, Missionary Association opened the Broad Street School for Negroes in Augusta in May 1865, and Simeon W. Beard was a teacher in February 1867, the same month that Morehouse was founded. Other schools for African Americans in Augusta were the Walker Street School, the Twig Street School, and, and where Dr. Mr. Eddie, uh, Defo, uh, Eddie Viso Belcher was a teacher in 1867. So in 1867, you had other schools in Augusta that also uh, had uh, teachers who were employed uh, at those schools. Uh, at the time of the founding of the Augusta Institute in February 1867, a school was already operating at Springfield Baptist Church. Friedman Bureau records show that the Springfield School was open uh, in November 1866, that is the school that was already at uh, at uh, Springfield Baptist Church. And in uh, March 1867, 40 uh, pupils were enrolled, and 38 of them were paying tuition. Of the 40 pupils, 17 were males, and 23 were females. Uh, the whole uh, amount of tuition paid by the freedmen during the month was $15. With a school for African, and that was fairly substantial at the time, but that was the total amount that was paid by all of the students who were attending uh, the school at Springfield at the time. With a school for African Americans already operating at Springfield Baptist Church and other schools for blacks holding classes in other parts of the city, why then was there a need for the Augusta Theological Institute? The charter of the National Theological Institute and University, as indicated in its name, legalized the establishment of branches of the institute uh, Washington-based institute uh, in key cities across the South for the training of ministers as well as for the holding of special institutes uh, on various and sundry topics from time to time. So if that was the mission of the National uh, Theological Institute to establish uh, training schools for ministers, and we're talking about African American ministers, and to hold special institutes on various and sundry topics from time to time, then that too uh, was the mission for the founding of the Augustal Institute to train African Americans for the ministry and to hold uh, various and sundry seminars and workshops from time to time. The preparation of African American men for the ministry, not merely the fundamentals of literacy, as was the mission of most Reconstruction schools for blacks, was the initial purpose of the Augusta Theological Institute. The Augusta Theological Institute did not begin classes right away, as no teachers had been assigned to instruct the 37 uh, students. Of the 37 students who applied, almost all were literate as a result of attending Reverend White's blockade school. William Jefferson White was commissioned to assume instructional duties, but he already was gainfully employed. He was not seeking employment, and while members, uh, a member of the Springfield Baptist Church, he was not a minister at that time. It is not known why the Reverend Henry Watts, pastor of Springfield, was not asked to become the first teacher at the Institute. Reverend Watts was the pastor of Springfield Baptist Church, but was not asked to become the first teacher. It was Watts who had vigorously recruited students for the Daring Enterprise and offered the church as the first campus. White, realizing that too much effort had been invested in this bold venture, could not abandon the fledgling project at its incipiency. He thought the enterprise was too important to be allowed to be taken over by persons with less capable, who were less capable, and not as devoted to the project as he was. He decided not to disassociate himself with the Augusta Institute, although he was employed by the Platt Brothers uh, Manufacturing Company where he made coffins. So he stuck with it. By the time, uh, about, about that time, White had decided to assume the duties as the first teacher of the Augusta Institute. He received a communique from, the, uh, from General Ola, Oliver Otis Howard, Commissioner of the Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands, Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands in uh, Washington, D.C., informing him that he had been appointed as field agent for the Bureau in Georgia with the duties of traveling across the state and supervising the work of the Bureau among African Americans. Why did decide uh, whether to teach at the Gus Institute uh, or become an agent for the Bureau? 
the offer to do the work of the Bureau in Georgia was very attractive and carried with it certain prestige. And in his heart of heart, hearts, William uh, Jefferson White wanted to take the plum assignment, but the first class of students were the first uh, at the Institute, and they were eager to begin classes. As he wrestled with his conscience about which path to take, he had the presence of mind to consult with Captain Charles H. Prince, who was in charge of the schools for blacks in Augusta. That was supported by the American Missionary Association, the Congregationalist Body. Prince, uh, 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 Mr. Prince, Captain Prince, agreed to help White by securing the services of three teachers for the Institute. Uh, these three white women were already, uh, already in Augusta teaching at American Missionary Schools, uh, and uh, their workload was challenging, to say the least. But they agreed to provide part-time instruction in the evenings at the theological school. And so we get the names of the first three teachers at what becomes Morehouse College, at that time known as the Augusta Theological Institute. And their names are Miss Julia H. Sherman, a Baptist who uh, had uh, been a part of C.H. Uh, Spurgeon's Tabernacle in London, England. Miss Sarah Burke, a Congregationalist from Binghamton, New York. And Miss Jane Jenny Welch from the western region of the country. Once again, the first teachers who uh, are employed at eventually what becomes Morehouse College and those of us who are teachers and have taught, uh, who are in the audience, uh, the heirs to the legacy of those first teachers at Morehouse College, three white women, Miss Julia H. Sherman, Miss Sarah Burt, and Miss Jane Welch. The challenges faced by the Augusta Theological Institute in the early weeks were revealed in an 1883 report of the work of the American Missionary Baptist Association. Although the official founding date of the, for the Institute in February 1867, it was in May 1867 that Reverend J.W. Parker, uh, a doctor of divinity of Massachusetts, arrived in Augusta under the auspices of the National Theological Institute to locate a school for the training of preachers for the colored people. And so very often he is considered to be one of the principal founders of the school, the Reverend Dr. J.W. Parker. The tenuous stability of the Augusta Theological Institute was reflected in the change of leadership over the next two years. J. Mason Rice took charge of the fledgling school when Reverend Parker took ill and returned to the North. Rice was followed in November of that same year by Charles H. Corey and his wife, who kept the school in a rented room and mostly at night. The Reverend Charles uh, H. Corey, who had uh, replaced Dr. Parker uh, as the head of the school, described the situation at that time. The times politically were unsettled. Prejudice was, uh, prejudices were strong, and with, with few facilities, not very much was accomplished. I had some warnings from the Ku Klux Klan, and on a few occasions, the city authorities, unsolicited by me, sent pol some policemen to protect our evening school. The Black Horse Cavalry, Jayhawkers, the Regulators were among the terrorist groups that sprang up in Georgia and across the South. Made up of ex-Confederate soldiers, these mobs beat, mutilated, and murdered freedmen, sometimes drove them from plantations to avoid paying wages, and offered, often practiced simple brigandage. These bands were later absorbed into the Ku Klux Klan. By May 1868, the enrollment had reached at the Gust Institute had reached 60 students, of whom 17 were studying for the ministry. When Reverend Corey's mission in Augusta ended in 1868, he was transferred to the Richmond Theological Institute and was replaced in Augusta by the Reverend Lucian C. Hayden, Doctor of Divinity, uh, the following winter. When the Reverend W.D. Siegfried arrived in Augusta to head the school in 1869, November 1869, it was agreed that a more permanent location for the school was needed. An, uh, an eligible lot uh, measuring 180 by 180 feet was purchased on Telfair Street for $5,700. But the conditions of the old building on the property where the school had been transferred and the racial climate in the city forced Reverend Siegfried to leave the city and the state, and the school was discontinued for a while. The school that was the Augusta Institute stopped operating for a while. It is at this time that the work of the Augusta Theological Institute was continued shortly thereafter at Harmony Baptist Church, very often considered the second campus for the, for the Institute. But quite frankly, there was a campus on Telfair Street before the Harmony Street, uh, Harmony Baptist Church uh, 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 campus. Uh, this church had been recently founded 
by the Reverend uh, William Jefferson White, who had become ordained as a minister by that time. Because of his strong voice on behalf of education uh, of blacks and Augusta and African Americans in general, White was almost lynched. It was this outspoken stand against racist forces that his membership at, Springs, uh, at Springfield became tenuous at best. It was because of his outspoken stand against racist forces that his membership at Springfield became tenuous at best. At worst, he was encouraged to quiet his voice or leave the congregation among whom the Augusta Institute had been founded. And that's why we were hoping that Dr. Donaldson was going to be here because his uh, uh, work is principally on William Jefferson White, and he has more details about uh, the position of William Jefferson White at Springfield. The boy, voices of passivity at Springfield did not abide the voices of activity. So on May the 10th, 1868, Mr. White and six others, Deacon Thomas, Brother Jacob McKinley, Sister Brown and daughter, Deacon Caesar Jackson, and with Deacon Horace Hughes, joined the founding members of the new congregation. That is, they left Springfield and formed Harmony Baptist. With letters of dismission from Springfield Baptist, they, uh, 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 they organized what was constituted as the Harmony Baptist Church. The newly established Augusta Theological Institute struggled to survive in an environment of hostility and oppression. In state after state, the Ku Klux Klan of the Knights of the White Camellia swept back the black tide and redeemed the land for those they believed to be the right Caucasian or masters. Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, and North Carolina were recaptured by 1871, and Alabama, Texas, and Arkansas by 1873. The anti-black movement worsened in July 1874 when representatives of all organizations met in New Orleans and formed the White League. The anti-black behavior of whites was so openly expressed in thoughts and actions across the South, was also expressed in Augusta, where the Augusta Institute was trying to get a footing. Struggling against odds in 1867, uh, 1870, was not the best time for the Augusta Institute. On the recommendation of all-white Georgia Baptist Church Convention, and endorsed by the all-black Georgia Baptist Missionary Convention, Reverend Joseph T. Roberts, a white Georgia citizen, was appointed by the Home Mission Board to lead the school. Robert began his work with the school on April the 1st, 1871. For the next eight years, Robert kept the school open against mounting odds, kept the school open, open in Augusta. The enrollment vacillated, the campus was not ideal, funds were uncertain, and the racial climate in Augusta was charged. But he kept the school open. And so, as I end, against all those odds, in 1871, when Reverend uh, Joseph Robert became the pastor of Springfield Baptist Church, uh, not the pastor of Springfield Baptist Church, but the headmaster of the Augusta Theological Institute, the candle was kept lit when it almost went out. And of course, the rest of the story will continue at another time. Um, but over the next several decades, uh, until uh, 1913, uh, the school moved from Augusta, as you well know, relocated to Atlanta in 1879. When it relocated to Atlanta in 1879, the school was called the Atlanta Baptist Seminary. And the first campus for the Atlanta Baptist Seminary was in Springfield, uh, in Friendship Baptist Church on Mitchell Street. It quickly moved up the street about a block away to Elliott and Hunter Street, where it constructed a building, and it was housed there for a while until Graves Hall opened in 1889 which becomes the first campus where we are today. Um, by 1897, the name changed again from the Atlanta Baptist Seminary to Atlanta Baptist College. But it was in 1913 when it was decided, as Mr. Calhoun will now tell us, the school became Morehouse College. But before Mr. Uh, Calhoun begins to make his presentation, all of the young men who are in the audience who are my students, you might want to come up and get a copy of the form that you need to fill out. Mr. Uh, we'll just ask Mr. Um, Spencer, would you pass them out? All right. Good. good morning. Um, as Dr. Barksdale said, I'm Darren Calhoun, a graduate of Morehouse College class of 2010. I am currently a MA candidate in history with a focus on African American studies at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. And my. Have to move the mic a 
All right. Um, my, the title of my research is The Politics of Philanthropy, Henry Lyman Morehouse, The American Baptist Home Mission Society, and the Naming of Morehouse College, 1912 to 1913. In 2017, Morehouse College will commemorate its 150th anniversary of its founding, a feat that many historically black colleges and universities will, ce will be celebrating within the coming years. In preparation for the occasion, a host of alumni, faculty, and staff in numerous fields were tasked to take a new look into the previous histories written on the school. The first being the History of Morehouse College by Benjamin Brawley in 1917, and the second being A Candle in the Dark, written by Dr. E.A. Jones in 1967. After evaluating the previous narratives, I found it a bit unsettling that the naming of the school was treated so lightly. In both works, the, the change from Atlanta Baptist College to Morehouse College was merely mentioned in passing as if it was not a major turning point in our history. So as a budding scholar, I've asked a question that many historians before me and that many will come, and the many that will come typically ask to add to our already hectic workload. Why? The previous works simply state that the school was named in honor of the man who had done much for Negro education. Yet I ask, why name the school for Dr. Henry Lyman Morehouse? The simple answer would be that he was a philanthropist, the correspondent secretary of the American Baptist Home Mission Society, and a member of the um, Board of Trustees for Atlanta Baptist Seminary and Atlanta Baptist College for 23 years. However, after scavenging numerous correspondences and organizational minutes, I found that, it, that the issue is significantly, significantly deeper than previously afforded. By examining the hegemonic nature of the American Baptist Home Mission Society and General Education Board, this work will question the name change of Atlanta Baptist College to Morehouse College. It was in 1912 the Board of Trustees of Atlanta Baptist College, then led by its first Negro president, Dr. John Hope, began talks of renaming the institution for the great friend of, Negro, of the Negro education movement. As quoted in the amended charter of 1913, on March 30th, 1912, the Board of Trustees being present in pro um, person or by proxy unanimously adopted the Atlanta Baptist College vote to change the name of the institution to Morehouse College if it should be met with the approval of the collective, uh, collective American Baptist Home Mission Society. Thereafter, nine months passed before the American Baptist Home Mission Society, the ABHMS, voted for the approval of the amendment as well as another five months for the petition to be filed with the Superior Court of Fulton County, uh, Fulton County Georgia. As I explore the nature of the renaming of the institution, many uncertainties come into mind. The institution has had four name changes throughout its history, the Augusta Theological Institute, Atlanta Baptist Seminary, Atlanta Baptist College, and Morehouse College, respectively. Each of the prior changes came with some sort of reorganization of the school, initially the move from Augusta to Atlanta, then from the status of a seminary to college. However, in 1913, with the final naming, the only changing factor of the institution was the death of one of its principal founders, Reverend William Jefferson White. Although Dr. Morehouse was a pioneer in the field of Negro education, at the timing of the change, many others were worthy of the highest honor he received. First, as just mentioned, Reverend William Jefferson White, a founder, 34-year trustee of the institution, and a constant supporter of all the Negro schools of Atlanta. Second, Dr. Joseph Robert, the first president of the institution who led the Augusta Theological Institute after its first, uh, last suspension of services, as well as overseeing the successful migration to Atlanta and the growth of the school, or even the principal funder of the General Education Board himself, John D. Rockefeller Sr., the billionaire philanthropist who funded many Negro schools, including the Spelman Seminary named after his wife, Laura Spelman. So why Dr. Morehouse? Morehouse College, the only all-male historically black institution of higher education, has a, uh, has a history that mirrors many institutions that were founded during the 19th century. The Morehouse oral tradition passed down across gener uh, generations reveal a story of goodwill missionary organizations, benev benevolent leaders, and the uh, perseverance of an institution that has endured its share of financial and cultural troubles. Founded, uh, founded February 14, 1867, the Augusta Theological Institute was the southernmost branch of the National Theological Institute, coordinated by Pastor Henry Watts of Springfield Baptist Church, Deacon Jonas Singleton, Deacon Jesse Jones, and Reverend William Jefferson White. In May of 1867, the ABHMS took official control of the school subsequent to the National Theological Institute's merger with the organization. Under the leadership of the, of the first president, Dr. Joseph Robert, the Augusta Institute thrived as a training school in Augusta until its relocation in 18, in, in, to Atlanta in 1879, 
when it received its first name and status change to, to the Atlanta Baptist Seminary. Two months after the move, the American Baptist Home Mission Society reorganized the board, officially establishing their dominating position in the seminary. On July 18, 1879, the newly formed Atlanta Baptist Seminary held a meeting at the headquarters of the ABHMS in New York to discuss the restructuring of the governing body. It was resolved that the board will remain with 12 members, but now comprising of two official committees, the executive board and the local board. The bylaws of the original board of trustees describes the organization of the committee as well as the ascendancy taken by the ABHMS. And I quote, the seven members of the board residing in and near New York shall constitute the executive committee of the board and shall possess the full powers of the board when the board itself is not in session. The executive committee shall elect their own chairman and secretary, and three members thereof shall constitute a quorum for transactions of business. The five members of the board residing in Georgia shall constitute the local committee and be charged with the duties of local administration under the instruction of the board of, exec of the executive committee. This board, now officially controlled by the all-white executive committee based out of New York, set the parameters of the decision making that would govern the school over the next six decades. The local committee seats were occupied by colored Baptists who supported the school since its inception, including Reverend William Jefferson White, co-founder, Reverend Frank Quarles, pastor of Friendship Baptist Church that played an influential role in the removal from Augusta. The executive committee comprised of members of the ABHMS, which included Dr. Henry Lamar Morehouse, well, correspondent secretary. His seat on this, new, on this newly formed board would be his first collaborations with the Negro Schools of Atlanta. The second name change of the institution occurred in 1897, as the school made its transition from the seminary to a degree-conferring college. The change brought about yet another reorganization of the institutional governing body, first dropping the local committee from five members to four, as well as, the dis as distinctly dictating the racial and paternalistic nature of the society in its updated bylaws. On February 18, 1898, it was resolved that the Board of Trustees of, the, of Atlanta Baptist College shall hereafter be composed of 11 members and so long as the college receives financial help from the American Baptist Home Mission Society, seven of them shall be white men and shall be appointed by the society. What role did this reoccurring system of racial dominance by the ABHMS have in the final naming of the institution? The white dominated executive committee unanimously voted on March 21, 1912 at the ABHMS headquarters that the name change of Atlanta Baptist College to, Mo uh, to change the name um, of Atlanta Baptist College to Morehouse College. According to the amended charter of 1913, nine days later, the local committee, uh, according, oh, excuse me, according to the amended charter of 1913, nine days later, four local committee members, consisting of Reverend William Jefferson White, adopted the change should it be met by the ABHMS and full body who met quarterly. However, it took nine months for the ABHMS to vote on its final decision regarding the matter. On April 25, 1913, four months after the final vote, the Secretary of the Board of Managers, Charles White, finally signed the ordinance to be sent to the Fulton County Clerk. What caused this exaggerated period of a simple name change has yet to be discovered. The school has, ha has had no subsequent real organization of the governing body. The school has had, uh, no, had no major status change of, to the extent of what took place in 1879 or in 1897. The only factor of change that occurred was the death of the man that stayed loyal to the school since its founding, Reverend William Jefferson White who died seven days prior. At the, at the time of the change, Dr. Henry Lyman Morehouse has had, had been relieved of his duties on the board for 12 years. Although his personal correspondences to the General Education Board do depict his constant support of Atlanta Baptist College for 12 years prior to the naming, his help in securing funds for the college was of minuscule proportions to that of other ABHMS, ABHMS run institutions, including our sister school, the Spelman System, uh, Seminary. Between the years of 1906 and 1912, the Atlanta Baptist College received two appropriations of special funds from the General Education Board, first of $500 toward the salary of an industrial teacher, which is very important inside of this conversation, and a second of $5,000 toward the building of a $40,000 structure, Cell Hall. After the renaming of the institution to Morehouse College in 1913, it is recorded that from 1914 to 1920, the school received stark, a stark increase of appropriations for a variety of projects. Although it was seen that the funding was heavily lobbied by Dr. Morehouse himself, seeing that he was just granted one of the highest honors in education by, the, by this institution, his personal correspondence has shown no record of him doing so. 
yet alone any mention of him receiving this honor. Lathan Crandall, dear friend of Dr. Morehouse and author of Henry Lima Morehouse, a biography, offers an extensive look into the life and legacy of Dr. Morehouse, particularly detailing his works and education of nearly 40 years of, with the ABHMS. Crandall's biography, as well as the ABHMS biographical sketch of Morehouse, state that many significant contributions as his effort state that the many significant contributions such as his efforts to found the University of Chicago in 1891 and raising support for Bacon College and Spelman College in detail regarding his philanthropic services toward these institutions. However, nowhere is it mentioned his services toward the institution has, that has come to bear his name. Henry Lyman Morehouse served on the executive board of Atlanta Baptist Seminary and Atlanta Baptist College for 23 years, ranging from 1879 until, 18, uh, until 1902 and once aspired to take lead of the institution in 1890. In a letter to his close friend and major funder of the education of Negroes, John D. Rockefeller, John D. Uh, two more, uh, uh, excuse me. In a letter to his close friend and major funder of the, uh, education Negroes, John D. Rockefeller, Morehouse wrote, and I quote, I've had 11 years service in the home mission society, have done, I think, a credible work, have carried a heavy load all the time, and have taken but little rest. <laughs> If I retire from this position, I can take charge of one of our schools for the colored people, that position being the correspondent secretary of the ABHLMS. Eleven years' knowledge and experience matters relating to work of, for, for the colored people. The point to which I am attracted is the college in Atlanta, and it's a Morehouse emphasis. And in a response letter, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rockefeller insisted that his work with the ABHMS in Chicago and in Alabama was far too important for him to be restricted to one school in Atlanta, therefore rejecting his proposal as if he was the CEO of the institution himself. 23 years after this rejection, the college was named for him in 1913, four years prior to his death. It is interesting to note that doc when Dr. Morehouse outlines his successes in higher education, he never mentions any work associated with the Atlanta School for Boys. Was this due to a sense of humbleness, or were there political undertones that he did not subscribe to with the renaming of the institution? This study is in no way de-emphasizing de the impact Dr. Henry Lyman Morehouse had on, the ninth, on 19th and 20th century Negro education, or advocating for the change of the name. However, it is questioning the reasoning behind the distinction he received as it relates to Atlanta Baptist College. To substantiate this change, it would be helpful to note the conversation of the two uh, boards through their meeting minutes and correspondences. However, through the, through the research conducted at the two depositories which hold in excess a collective of 200 years of American Baptist Home Mission Society records, being the Rockefeller Archive Center in Sleepy Hollow, New York, and the uh, American Baptist Historical Society in Atlanta, constantly 13 months of organizational minutes are, uh, meeting minutes are missing, March 1912 to April 1913. When letters of requesting funding um, resume, when letters of, of request and funding resume in 1913, there is no mention of the change, yet Dr. Hope, Hope and others carry on as if it were business as usual. So then again, I ask the perennial question of the, uh, in the fashion of an inquisitive child, why? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Calhoun. Uh, we're going to have a moment uh, when we're going to allow you to ask questions and make comments and engage us. Uh, but uh, the research team has mused over of this issue of why the college was named for Henry Lyman Morehouse. Some of you may recall that at Founders Week uh, this year, Founders Day particularly, members of the Morehouse family uh, visited us and was in uh, King Chapel uh, at the time of the convocation. And they are going to donate and have donated some of Henry Lyman Morehouse's effects uh, to our archive. Uh, I understand that there is a Henry Lyman Morehouse diary that's held uh, by one of the members of the Morehouse family who lives in Atlanta. And we are hopeful that we will be able to get that diary. Mm. But in our conversations about why the college was named Morehouse, which of course uh, in uh, uh, 2013, I don't think anybody wants to change the name. Uh, uh, at the uh, next session, another one of the presenters will talk about what happened in 1969 when the so-called Morehouse Revolution erupted. And uh, there was conversation about changing the name of all of the schools in the Atlanta University Center to King University in honor of uh, the slain civil rights uh, leader who had died in uh, uh, 1968, who was assassinated in 1968. But that never happened. We kept the names of the schools in the Atlanta University Center. 
Very often we say that, well, if Spelman was named for John D. Rockefeller's wife, Laura, why didn't we name Morehouse Rockefeller College to balance it? I'm, I'm pausing for emphasis as I say in classes. We would have been Rockefeller College. Spelman would have been Spelman College. The marriage, Rockefeller, Spelman, but that didn't happen. But the one that we really uh, take uh, some uh, muse in is the fact that why didn't they name it White College for William Jefferson White, as, uh, as Mr. Calhoun kind of alluded. Um, we would have been known as White College had that been the case. But it was named for Henry Lyman Morehouse, and we are glad to know that his family is finally, finally acknowledging that uh, they had not been to the campus. Um, his um, great-grand-niece, uh, Crystal Morehouse, did come initially and make the first contact with us, and so we're glad to have that um, that uh, renewed or first contact with the Mars family, uh, and perhaps it can help us to tell the story more um, uh, in depth than previously. So, uh, but but we've come from Augusta, where we struggled, moved to Atlanta, changed the name several times, and we're at the point now in 1913 where the college has become Morehouse College with William. Uh, with Dr. Um, John Hope as the president of the college at that time. We are open for questions or comments. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, why do you feel the Morehouse family has been so distant from the institution? I don't think they knew about the institution. <laughs> I, I, when Crystal Morehouse came in 2009, yeah. she I believe she alluded to that she knew nothing of the school being named after her great uncle. Um, so I think it was just, um, in a sense, just ignorance of them not knowing about Morehouse College and the family legacy not being passed down at the school because he never actually alluded to it. Mm. And do you feel like, it, um, just to go on what you stated earlier in your presentation, how he never really acknowledged the institution? So do you feel that that is? because he never out, outwardly acknowledged the institution. So he, if he didn't outwardly acknowledge it, he didn't in turn in his, internally acknowledge it to his family members as well? Definitely. And even if they read his biography, um, that Lake of Crown Road, there's no mention of Morehouse College being in there. Um, they, he mentions the line of that was female seminary, which was spelled in college, but you know, Morehouse College. I mean, the records of two shows that he advocated more for my sister school spelled it, maybe get them out. So we think that was because of the leaders of that school, and Sophia Packard and Harry Giles, um, was able to, uh, to get him to advocate more uh, from the Rockefeller family than they did for the Marks. Uh, there was a great uh, love for spelling by the Rockefeller family. It's a good thing. I'm not being critical at all. I should be able to get that. That's why I said that name. Well, Rockefeller would be Rockefeller College. I mean, you know, took some one and a half to another, perhaps the money would have flowed our way as well, but that did not happen. Because by 1913, before we get to the question, that's the number. By 1913, uh, Henry Lyman, uh, not Henry Lyman, John D. Rockefeller had decided to stop doling out money in pieces but formed the Rockefeller Foundation. General and Education that, Board. Yeah, the General Education Board. And so that was a different uh, kind of structure at that time. Mr. John. It, it almost appears that Morehouse College is building Mr. Morehouse's name versus Morehouse name building the college. Um, do we know much about him personally? His, uh, as far as his views, his meanings, whether he was for segregation, whatever it may be, that's one. Um, two, it also seems almost like the master naming the slave and the slave just carrying his name on <laughs> with pride. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, you know, can we redefine the name Morehouse and separate it from that person? Uh, it, that, that's my question. Um, actually, I actually want to take that second and first. I think we already have. I always say that John Hope uh, built Morehouse and Benjamin Mays made it a brand. Um, but prior to 19, uh, what would you say? The, Depression. Morehouse was not inside the naming of those elite schools. When you look here at the elite black schools in the South and all the records, you will see Fisk and you see Howard Hampton Spelman, but Morehouse was not upon that um, list. While Dr. Hope was building this, uh, building this school, he made it what it was, and then 
Bishop Amaze made it important. We haven't been associated with, more, um, with the name, the person who relied on Warren since 1917, um, when he passed. Um, so I think we've been detached from him. We made it our own thing. Um, as far as his personal views, it's still a little sketchy. I mentioned in my paper that um, that the industrial, uh, we got $500 prior to 1912, uh, 1913 for industrial education. That's very important because the general education board, the, founding, uh, the funders of appropriations during that time, funded by Rockefeller himself, they pushed for the disenfranchisement and industrial education model of uh, Hampton and Tuskegee model for a lot of these schools. If you did not subscribe to that, they were pretty much withholding funding from you. Um, that's where the policy was for lack of coming in because Dr. John Hope was the Negro president at the time and we weren't really trying to have an industrial education program. Um, during that time, we had a bar, and we hired an industrial education teacher. Just so we can try to get funding. We tried to manipulate the system to get funding, which a lot of HBCUs were doing at that time. However, it didn't really work out for us. So we had to, um, I'm starting to see now that we, uh, we probably use another way to get that money um, by changing the name to Morehouse College. So we work on the change to our industrial education school. So let's change the name to Morehouse College and give you one thing next year. Um, when we look at the name itself, there was a move a few years ago to try to re redefine the name or recalibrate the name in terms of the Moors of North Africa, Black House, Moors, and some people began to spell it M-O-O-R-H-O-U-S-E, Moors. That didn't last long because the name is not that. It's officially M-O-R-E-H-O-U-S-E. Um, it is a brand now, um, and as Mr. Calhoun pointed out, with few exceptions, most of the historically black colleges are, particularly the private ones, are named for some uh, non-black person, uh, with the exception of the African Methodist Episcopal schools. Morris Brown is named for Bishop uh, Morris Brown, who was an African American person. Uh, Paul Quinn, Allen University, Richard Allen, Paul Quinn for Bishop Paul Quinn, they are the only ones that are named for um, 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 a, um, for African Americans. Um, but it is an intriguing and interesting concept or idea should we change the name. And the reason we have not changed the name based on what I've come to understand is that because it is a brand, we fear that we will lose some connectivity, some um, uh, sense of who we are in the larger arena of philanthropy if we change the name to something else. Mm -hmm. We redefine it and disassociate it because before disassociate from well, well from anything that which is why I asked the first question, how much do you know about this person? Did he own yes. slaves? Oh, okay. Did he lynch anyone? Was he part of the clan? I mean if we know the background of the person, then I'm I'm comfortable with yeah. the the name. But then if we don't know anything about this person and now they're coming back on the bandwagon and we say, hey, welcome all. You know, yeah. the, the question is, what do we know about the name, or are we going to take the name as we've done and make it our own, yeah. and just let it be a new genesis? Yeah, therefore, what we know, he was a pretty decent man. He, okay. um, before, uh, you can say, but he was a pretty decent man. He was a great part of Negro education. Probably, I would say about six or so, he didn't found, but he helped you know, receive funding and um, Push for funding for African HBCUs during that time. We found the University of Chicago, Dayton College. Um, definitely got a lot of money for Florida schools and Shaw and that. But yeah. he was a great friend of Negro College. So he he is des uh, he deserved an honor. But, but why not University of Chicago or why not Bacon? Because he got received millions of dollars for the schools, not just thousands of dollars. He did for more. He received millions of dollars for those schools. And he helps them about their development. So why not name these schools, well, these other schools that are more for? Well, like all of us who advocated for black education in the uh, 19th and uh, early 20th century, they were paternalistic. Mm -hmm. they, they were trying to uplift these uh, ignorant, uh, illiterate blacks who had just been feared out of slavery. And they were afraid, as we have come to conclude, that if they did not uh, show some missionary zeal among them, that they would go astray and maybe go in a direction that they, it was about control for all intents and purposes. Uh, so that uh, uh, Walter Rodney in the 
Twenties wrote the book about uh, uh, the new Negro on campus, where the African Americans on college campuses, and most of them were in the South, began to protest the paternalism of the campuses. Uh, and they were advocating for name changes and for a whole lot of other things. So, you know, you had that paternalism. But what do you do when you're trying to solicit funds and, 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 and uh, you're trying to raise money uh, as President Wilson, our 11th president of the college, is trying to do? I mean, you know, we deserve money from the Rockefeller Foundation. We deserve money from other corporations and, and, uh, and uh, 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 foundations. So. Um, yeah, I, I think we are, we are recognized as an historical black college, but a college that has always welcomed other races. Mm -hmm. The laws of the South prevented non-blacks from coming in, in some numbers prior to the recent years. But we have never said no. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, this paternalistic nature lasted for, like I said, well over six decades. Um, even after the aviation must pull their funding, the board stayed predominantly white until what, recently, in yeah. the 70s, 80s. Um, that's what one of the uh, board, board of trustees. Yeah, um, board of trustees. I'm not going to get into transparency and <laughs> adaptation, but that was one of the things they fought for. They demanded for us out that 1969 revolution for the white uh, board of trustee members to resign because they were, we weren't receiving any money from the ABHMS um, anymore. However, they still had a dominating position on our boards. And like I said, there was one. First, it was inside of our constitution for 1897. But after we lost our funding, then why are you still on board? So. Yeah, we seven ties with the American Baptist Home Mission Association in 1936. And uh, there was this conflict over leadership. Uh, indeed, Dr. Mays comes in 1940, and he's our most revered and venerated president of the college. I'm one of Billy's boys, having graduated from college in uh, 1965. However, Dr. Mays was somewhat paternalistic. He was a father figure for those of us who uh, studied in Morris when he was president for 27 years. And I'm not saying that in a negative way about Dr. May, so uh, you know, please don't, don't get this to me, Dr. Bob, I was saying this about, because I love Dr. May, so he advocated for me in many ways, and I knew him fairly personally, fairly well. But, but he was somewhat, somewhat, he was paternalistic in his views of Morris, and we, we, we advocated and brought into that. Uh, when we get to the session, uh, this afternoon with uh, Dr. Louis Sullivan, Dr. Um, Seven Du Bois Cook, and, and Dr. Johnny Houston. They also were students at Morris under the presidency of Dr. Mays. And of course, uh, Dr. Cook's book is on Dr. Mays, so that should be very interesting to hear their presentations on Dr. Mays. But he was somewhat precarious, but in a different way, of course. Well, no, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mays was an African American. Uh, presidents today can't be that kind of we're looking more for the CEO type, I think, something like a fusion of scholar and corporate executive type money. Uh, it's, it's what we need to keep things up. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Marks, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Calhoun, I just wanted to thank you for, for what you do. That long time. Very important work, very important. It's very exciting that you really did a fantastic job. Thank I just had two quick questions. I need to more address to you, Dr. Boxdale. What exactly is the nature of the relationship between uh, the Reverend Terry and actually William Jefferson White? I mean, it seems like those strategic moves being made in sending Reverend Coulter specifically to uh, William Jefferson White with a letter. I mean, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? And my second question is, can you also share with us a little bit more about the fact there was a school at Springfield Baptist Church in 1866 before actually the Augusta Institute yeah. What happened to that church and was there any element of rivalry or competition? Do we even know what the name of that particular school is? It's called the Springfield School. Uh -huh. It was called the Springfield School, so actually at that point then I go back to the relationship between Turner Cole and, and uh, White. Um, that's what it was called, as most of the schools were called. They were generally uh, Freedom Bureau schools. And, so what about, and the, um, the, the pupils, if you will, the students who attended were decidedly younger than the students who attended the um, Augusta Theological Institute. As I said in the paper, they were usually much older, deacons, and had already been preaching, but just wanted to become more literate and be able to, be able to, as they say, exegete the Bible a little better. We say that now, probably just interpret the Bible a little better than, than they had before. 
Um, and so that was kind of the, one of the reasons, I think, why the Augusta Institute was founded um, because of a need to have a more literate, more educated, and informed ministry. Just like Harvard, as you may recall, Harvard was founded because they wanted a very literate ministry to head the congregational churches in New England. And, so, and then, of course, it grew into the very Harvard that we have today. Uh, but, but I think that was one of But also the socioeconomics uh, of the church in the larger book that will be a part of our uh, sesquicentennial that I'm writing, I talk about in greater detail the socioeconomics of the church. And, now, Mr. Cashin in this book talks about it. That was a fairly uh, substantial free black population in Augusta. And while we don't always want to acknowledge it, there's always been a class structure in African uh, The class structure has not, not always been at odds with each other, but there's always been that. And I don't know how we would call it today, but I suppose in the language of today, we would call that the move to church, the, the, the uh, upper crust church. Populated by lots of free blacks in the sun's way. But it was the prestigious church. And of course, when William Gibson White became a little bit outspoken, and he was somewhat of a, of a rebel rouser, a radical, a militant advocate for African American rights, and he was African American. Uh, we talk about that in greater detail in the book. But what was the race in William Gibson White? But back to your question, there was no real close relationship between attorney and white, except through correspondences. I don't know, I remember finding any evidence to show that they ever met in power. Mm -hmm. Because eventually the National Theological Institute was going to go out of business. With the work. Huh? With the work, yeah. But the, but the uh, uh, Augusta Institute will continue under the auspices of the American Baptist Home Mission uh, Society. Um, but it was a fortuitous relationship with, with Colta in the middle. I often wondered that if Colter had taken that letter somewhere else, oh, I don't know, across the river to Aiken, South Carolina. Why did he come to Atlanta with it? Well, we say that he went back to Augusta because that's where he was from. He had been a slave on a plantation in Richmond County before he left with his Confederate overlord. And then he ran away, fled from that situation to freedom after the Civil War and wanted to come back home. That was true of, 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 of thousands of African Americans who had fled to freedom in the North and the Midwest, principally to the Northeast. They returned to the South after the Civil War. Um, so it was just fortunate that it happened like that. One of those, what we call accidents of history, where somebody does something at this time, and as we say, the rest is history. Um, he decided to come back. And I often wonder if he had not given the letter to Dr. to, to William Jackson White. Why did he give it to Henry Watts? Henry Watts was the pastor of the church. We forget very often that, that Henry Watts and Jonas Singleton and, and, and others in that church were just as were very important to the founding of Moas as William Jefferson White. The reason we call William Jefferson White the founder and the reason we have a building on this campus named for him is that he stayed with the church for decades until he died. Yeah, you know, seven days, I think, before the yeah. college was named a month. So, so he stayed with it. He moved to Atlanta. I think he had two residences. You know, he was fairly well off. He had to move to um, add to that, um, another question that arises from what you were just saying is, if, what would have happened if we would have stayed in Augusta? Will we, have, will we be as prominent and as large as we are now, or will we be on the wayside of the lower in HBCUs? Um, uh, going out of business. Or, or would Augusta be prominent? Oh, exactly. Augusta be prominent. Yeah, but they have brought yeah, the capital to Augusta. Go well, back to Augusta. Yeah, because the capital of Atlanta, you know, they, 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 we didn't become the capital city, Atlanta, until after Moss was founded, I think, in 1868. Maybe. Yeah, when, when, when the capital moved to Atlanta from Billingsville, Georgia. Um, but yeah, as you well know, there's another HBC in Augusta, Payne College. And so one day, if Moas had stayed there, the Augusta Baptist Institute had stayed in Augusta, would there have been a need for pain? I think pain is under the auspices of the CMB, I believe. That's their religious affiliation. And perhaps so. Um, but but we, we don't know. We know what happened. That's what we do in history, is try to recreate the past as best we can from the existing records. And, and uh, as Mr. Calhoun has pointed out, uh, there are very good records at the Rockefeller Archives 
in a Sleepy Hollow, New York, where we have been on two occasions to research it, among those records. Um, but we need to know a little bit more about Turner. Uh, we have not explored all of the evidence that they have at the Library of Congress. We've been there twice. And we need to go back. We, you know, this is an ongoing process. We are, we are about halfway through. So we need to discover more about uh, uh, Edmund Turney, certainly more about Richard Colton, because if you really you know, factor everything, you have to give great credit to Richard Colton. He was the one with the letter. You know. Yeah. Uh, 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 Will Jeffrey White was working, had a job, had a wife, and apparently he was prominent. In Augusta. He didn't even need this. So that's right. Point out in fact, he didn't need this. But he did come on board, and we're very grateful and thankful that he did. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I thank you so much for your paper, Mr. Andy Paul. Uh, do we know much more about the uh, conspicuously absent minutes from the archives? Where those might be, why they were removed, and what extent they're associated with other parts of the unforced story. I'm, I'm finding more about it. The more I do my research, I'm finding more about I'm finding more out about that. Um, I could talk about James Anderson when he wrote a book on the history of black education from 1860 to 1902 or whatnot. Uh, 1913, I'm sorry. Um, you know, he did a lot of research on the land of you know, historical black education and has done a lot of research on the Rockwell archives and from his notes was that, from his notes they saying pretty much that uh, a lot of the records are restricted. Um Rockefeller archives here likes to sanitize a lot of the, um, a lot of their records. Um, finding that out now from the, I, I don't see any records of, um, of any type of restricted files. Um, I but it, it kind of makes sense because once you start um, putting uh, Damaging information out mm -hmm. about your about your organization, about your photographic uh, givers over the past hundred years, that your legacy can be smudged. You don't want to smudge your memory. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's still it's still a little shaky. I don't. Really. We're still trying to locate the names of the board of trustees and all kinds, even as recent. Amazing, and I think they're about to be shipped out. As uh, has uh, said to me. Tell me what you want, and we will locate them. But um, trying to construct a very strong archive from us is one of the missions of the project as well. Uh, but that's a very important uh, question, record, because we need records to recreate things. And where you can't find the records, you speculate. And that's not always good, because the speculation may not be on point. But you have to do something to move forward. light that you guys are or that you are giving to the school would allow for those uh, entities, those other uh, uh, organizations to want to help or want to uh, instill funds into the school? Yeah. Um, I'll say one part that we, the, the one main focus on the history project that we've been working on is the oral history project. And that's um, starting where we need to start with the, with the alumni. As soon as we get alumni given, then alumni, but then other organizations will see our alumni given and get back. And with more alumni actually feeling important again and have a connection to the uh, school, they're, they're bound to get it. And I think we can put some type of correlation to the deal. And, and has, since you guys have started and have, uh, I mean, I know you say you're only about midway through it now, but has any alum, has anybody just hearing about it come forward to offer the funds or to want to assist? Not quite. We have we have gotten a check. <laughs> we have gotten some uh, uh, pledges that that we we are gonna ramp up that. That's gonna be ratcheted up very soon because we're gonna need more money going forward uh, before we even pay the many questions and we take a break and then we have our next session at 11 o'clock. Um, uh, we, we, we certainly uh, are going to do that. As you well know, there will be a film uh, that will be produced on the history of Moir, so it will be part of the larger uh, project. There are 11 parts to this project, and I won't get into it right now. 
And one of them was a friend of the film. And Dr. Frederick Knight, who's uh, the chairman of the history department, has taken a lead in that. And I think Dr. Crawford's real working with them on that. And uh, Dr. Um, uh, Stephanie Dunn, who will be speaking in the next session, is working with them. You don't need money. And one uh, original estimate, we have, we have, that budget has been reduced. But one original estimate was being for six to seven million dollars to reduce the film that I did. That has changed. So we're going to have a documentary film, but it won't be you know, a, a film film, but we get actors and sets and location charts and all that. Some of that will be done. But yeah, but that, that's one of the, the missions, one of the objectives of the project. One, to commemorate and celebrate Morehouse, but also, to attract money and, and bring profile, bring um, image to the college, which we already have, but a broader image to people who may not know uh, about the world. And sometimes, you know, the bar is disturbed by people who live in Atlanta who don't know more and get us confused with other schools with the M name. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question about uh, history and especially history of Morehouse College. As you've outlined uh, the institutional uh, construction, institutional heritage mm -hmm. of the college falls within a broad uh, period of American history, mm -hmm. missionary Baptist education expanding post-Civil War. There's another, uh, I think, intellectual milestone in the 1890s that I know that we all talk about uh, with respect to the heritage of this school in Atlanta University Center, mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the talented tenth, the ideal that uh, of the Atlanta uh, Baptist Home uh, mission that you spoke of, yeah. uh, that was uh, communicated through W.E.B. Du Bois, was at Atlanta University, I believe, uh, and was looking also uh, to uh, the expansion of industrial education, positive Bible T. Washington, Atlanta Compromise. Uh, I think we talked a lot about that. That probably deserves it the same uh, a separate session. But with respect to the late 1890s and the intellectual heritage uh, and the cultural uh, and social environment of that period. How did the college uh, adapt and change uh, with those two those, those forces? Uh, again, we talk a lot about the, I guess, the institutional uh, heritage of, the, of, of this college, but what about the intellectual heritage and its, its impact on how Morehouse would develop from the 1890s to this period of 1913? very pivotal in American history, uh, but as well for the history of the, uh, intellectual thought in yeah. African American thought. Yeah. Well, you know, we were somewhat divided. I hate to say schizophrenia, but the, you had the industrial manual arts notion of the education of African Americans, and we had the classical education, the liberal arts education. Of course, it was, I think, you know, Anna Morris was mm -hmm. coined the phrase, the talent of ten, and Adam mm -hmm. Boys, and the boy picked it up and popularized it. But at any rate, the bottom line is that John Hope was a close friend of, of Du Bois. It must be remembered that in the 1890s and for the first half of the decade of the 20th century, the leaders of Marx, the president, were white, not black. And uh, it was because of that reason that, that, that the social climate, the racist, segregationist, Jim Crow got society at that time kind of dictated that the leaders of the colleges um, for African Americans be, uh, be non-black because they could interact with the white community a little better. We wonder if, if the first president uh, of Mohawk had, had been an African American when they moved from Augusta to Atlanta. But, the, but that was that, that, um, that whole kind of issue of what direction black education would take. And of course, Moha stayed the course and decided that it would continue the classical route with some uh, um, uh, manual arts education at Moha. There was some industrial education, blacksmithing, I think, and you know, tailoring and so forth. That, that was a farm that we had for a short while. Um, but it was that, that trying to decide what direction black education would take. Uh, many of the philanthropists were leaning toward more of the um, Booker T. Washington philosophy, which of course dominated the period from 1895 until his death in 1915. And that's what we call it the age of Booker T. Washington. And because he was so powerful, John Hope was kind of caught between the two men. If you look at the John Hope papers, which we have a, mo a lot of them at the Robert W. Wooden Archives in Atlanta, uh, uh, here, 
uh, uh, you see some of the correspondences between John Hope and Booker T. Washington. And he, of course, had to very often get Booker T. Washington's support for funds that may be directed to Mars. Mars certainly was not as wealthy as, uh, as Tuskegee. And when we talk about the academies for African at that time, uh, at that time, the HBCUs, Tuskegee was up there. Tuskegee was very prestigious at that time. And so you had to decide what direction you would take. Morehouse and some of the other liberal arts colleges decided to stay the course, or excuse me, and prepare their students in a classical liberal arts way. I don't know whether that answers your question, but uh, it was that kind of time. Preaching and teaching was still the big profession staff. One final question, because it's almost time to take a break. Yeah, it's just a follow-up. I found the question, as a matter of fact, of uh, thinking about that, too. Thank you for raising that question. I'm very interested in the, you know, you, everybody can see the stuff on the surface. I like the politics of what went on in the dark room behind yeah. the fact that that's, that's what led to the point. And, and so I, I know that at that time everything was strictly philanthropic. It probably they wanted to control the neighbors, see what we were doing, and then you put somebody there so you can pay attention to that. Is there someone in those meetings that's still alive? Okay. <laughs> Is there a way to get it outside of asking for that? Um, I would look at other ways as well. Um, the maid, the cook, you know, the person who serves the, the coffee, the, you know, who owned the building. I would look at all areas of who could be connected to that other than just going to them and asking them to release that. Because there's something more to that, and I'm very interested in the behind the scenes, more so than just what I see now manifesting in front of me. That, the meeting minutes are uh, all very problematic, because oh, that was just telling the story out just to it would be my right. too easy. So um, one, another way I'm trying to tackle this whole question um, is looking at the, the cultural side. So looking at the students, I see what they, uh, they popped up one day at the schools and they're taking out uh, E.A. Jones put first and put that they took down the marker and put up Moss College. What were, what were the students saying about this? The letterhead is another thing that's very, of course, very minuscule, but it's very important to where you see in 1912 the letterhead was allowed about this college again. And in 1914, when the letters picked back up, they said Moss College, formerly known as Atlanta about this college. What were the alums saying? We have, Moss has always had a very deep, ego and pride about our school. Uh, you see with that more Kyle Wyatt Jackson graduated in 1911, Vision of Brawley, who was there, who was teaching and going on at the time. We have a very deep pride in our school. What were the alumni saying that about the Latin Baptist College? I think it's at the cab we have our baseball team picture and you know, and they fly to Atlanta Baptist College banners. One, where is that stuff at? Where is the where is the flag and where are the jerseys and women? That's a whole other question, but um, how did the baseball, how did our sports, we had a big rivalry with Atlanta University, the undergraduate school at the time. How did everybody feel about this change? That's another way of looking at, um, looking at the name change. But like I said, the, those meeting minutes, that was, that's very important. Now, I can't wait until we get into that now. Uh, uh, that, that will be the day that I'll probably follow up because that when I look inside that diary, um, it will tell everything that his <laughs> Why did he never mention it? So once I can decide that diary, I feel just open everything up. Mark L. Y. Johnson, you know, goes on to become the first black president of Howard in the end. And of course, he's a graduate of Mars in 1911. He graduated from Atlanta Baptist College. And they, they like that name. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you here now, when they were talking about changing the name to King, the university, a person that we would be invigorate, most of us who graduated from Mars, we don't want the name changed. And even now, when we're talking about change, we don't want the name because we graduated from this school with one name. We really wanted something else. First class, as we close, to graduate from Morehouse College, graduated when the college was 50 years old in 1917. School was named Morehouse in 1913. That is the name change. And then the first group of, of students to finish Morehouse That's with a awesome. degree it was in 1917. All before that, uh, you had. Uh, uh, that is who entered, obviously you had people graduating in 1914, 15 from the college, but the first class to come in to Morehouse as freshmen who graduated from Morehouse four years later graduated in 1970. We want to thank you for coming. I thought it was a very excellent uh, audience. I was very pleased.
there, please. As you well know, we will be going on all day. I hope they left the uh, continental breakfast out so that we can get some refreshments. But we will be going all day. In a few minutes, we will start the second session. And then the luminaries will come at 2 o'clock. Then we have a final session uh, with uh, Dr. Spruill is here, see, and he's going to be presented in that session at uh, uh, this afternoon, late that afternoon. And of course, we have a reception uh, this afternoon at 5.30, so if you have to leave uh, and can come back, we do invite you to come back for the reception. Uh, I will say that we have heavy hors d'oeuvres, so you might want to come back. For I want to bring up that poem and those who are here for the second session. Uh, you want to get the different colors. Thank you so much. It was, it was 